Okay, welcome everyone. It's um, just gone past four o'clock, so I think we might get started. So thanks so much for coming, and we have a number of people joining us online as well. Uh, but yeah, we're very happy we can meet again in person and very happy we can welcome Sally Shorthall here to present in person also. Soon I'll pass over to uh, Bettina Bock, who will introduce Sally more formally, but I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the seminar series for those who haven't uh, attended one before. So my name is Mark Bickle, for those who don't know me. I'm an assistant professor in the Rural Sociology Group, and along with my colleague Lizette Nicole, who's online at the moment, because uh, she's in the Philippines on fieldwork, we are the conveners of this uh, 75th anniversary seminar series that's been running uh, since last year uh, and is leading up to a celebration event this Friday, uh, which we're very excited about. Uh, so this is a 75, 75 years of existence of the Real Sociology Group. And for us, this is a nice time to pause and reflect on our own research agendas and the future direction of the research group. And to do that, we thought it would be a really nice idea to invite all the scholars that inspire us and that we uh, cite and work with uh, in our own research um, to help us set our future research agenda. So over the last, it's been 18 months now, we've heard uh, from uh, a number of inspiring scholars on a whole range of diverse themes. And we're very happy to be ending the series uh, today with Sally Shortall and her presentation on gender and agriculture. So just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping before I hand over to Bettina, who will uh, host the rest of the session. Uh, this, this is being recorded and it will be posted later on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session uh, for about half an hour at the end. So Sally will present uh, until around 5 p.m. perhaps, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. Those online can, of course, participate in the Q&A. Uh, you can leave uh, questions in the chat and we'll get to those as we go. And then finally, we have uh, drinks following this for those here in person uh, at 5.30. So yeah, please do hang around and join us um, in the cafeteria downstairs, but we'll lead you down there after the session. So, I now pass over to Bettina Bock, who will introduce Sally. I will not say last. Uh, Sally and I met here actually, not in this room, but in bargaining about 23 years ago at the occasion of organizing a gender and agriculture conference. I think many of you probably know Sally Shorter by name. He's done a lot of research on gender and agriculture, but also gender inclusivity of rural development, also on participatory rural development, on rural proofing, and on, I would say, science and polity interaction more in general. I brought a couple of books, not all books, but not uh, coincidentally, also a number of books we've worked on together, <laughs> because those I have in my library, and we are also thinking of maybe producing a third one together, <laughs> another one together. I think you will enjoy, oh, she is, at the moment she has the Duke of Northumberland Chair of Rural Economy at the Centre of Rural Economy at the University of Newcastle, before she worked in Belfast. She has been the president of the European Rural Sociology Society and at the moment is the president of the International Rural Sociology Association. So she's a big person. <laughs> Sally will talk first, give a presentation, and then there. I think it's best to keep your questions for after, and then I will try to organize the Q&A session. Tell me how about did you forget something very, very important? Absolutely not. I'll get started. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm very pleased to have been asked to give a lecture in this series. I'm very pleased to be here in Wageningen, where I always consider I have great colleagues and friends. 
a little bit more nervous than usual because one of my sons is sitting down there and <laughs> he will certainly tell me the truth. But I'm very grateful to friends and to colleagues who've come to this in-person event. Uh, the Centre for Rural Economy is also celebrating a birthday. We're 30 years old this year, so we have quite a way to go. So I'm going to talk about uh, some reflections on where we have got to in uh, with women and agriculture and research and look at some future directions. And because you're celebrating 75 years of sociology, I'm also using a sociology lens on that. And I'll refer to quite a lot of work that Bettina and I have done together, who's both a great colleague and a great friend. So Mark, how do I make it move? Ah, there we go. So I'm going to kind of reflect on women in agriculture over the past 40 years, what we've been doing. That's when it really became an area of research. And it's interesting because that's when gender equality also really started to change. And I'll talk a bit about the changes that have happened there, but how much slower that progress has been in um, for women in agriculture. And then I'm going to look at some future directions. So I'm going to look at how we have tended to study women in agriculture, which is very much at a micro level. I'll explain what I mean by these terms. And I'm going to say a little bit more about how we might look at these questions going forward using a sort of a sociological framework. And I'm going to say something about why change is slow, you know, because um, when I started doing research on this, women didn't really own land. Their work wasn't counted for much in statistics. They uh, were underrepresented in training. All of these things are still there. So why is that? Why has there been such limited uh, development for women in agriculture compared to, say, science, technology, um, engineering and so on? I'm going to draw on three recent studies. One was a piece of work for the Scottish government on the role of women in agriculture. This is really interesting because actually they didn't really have any work on uh, women in agriculture. But what's really interesting about this, and I'll talk about the importance of political commitment as I go along, is that I don't know if you are aware that Nicola Sturgeon, the first minister of Scotland, when she rocked up, she rocked up with a gender equal cabinet. And every committee that has been formed since then has two co-chairs, a man and a woman, and has a gender equal committee membership. She launched the research report on women in agriculture and set up a task force. The task force was co-chaired by a minister, a man, a woman sheep farmer, and it had an equal number of men and women. And that actually proved to be really important in helping achieve the effectiveness of the task force. Because often when we were presenting our findings, we would field three men. So it was an interesting lesson for me that having men and women champion the equality of women in agriculture helped. So, yeah. The second piece of work is uh, a confidential report I did for the European Court of Auditors, which kills me because I think it's one of the best pieces of work I've ever done. Um, I can publish from some, I did four case studies that was funded by Research England. I can use that. I can use the data that's in the public domain, but I can't use the sort of elite interviews they set up for me, the European Court of Auditors, with people in DG Agri, DG Just, um, DG Imp
at that. So early research was trying to highlight women's unpaid work in the family farm, which wasn't publicly recognised, was kind of private. You could still say some of that is going on. You will have noticed the title of my PhD was Farmers' Wives. That's still the main way women come into farm is through having a partner who's a farmer. And then the EU uh, moved from just funding farming to the Rural Development Programme. And as part of that funding, provided quite a lot of funding for farm diversification activities. And here we saw women getting involved in these entrepreneurial activities, starting tourism initiatives, pet crematoriums and disused buildings, all kinds of interesting activities or making yogurt or some speciality um, food production. And it was a way of being involved that was slightly outside the traditional kind of farming role. And then we saw a lot of these businesses and Bettina's done an awful lot of really good and important work on that, looking at how these initiatives were judged on male entrepreneurial norms. So they were seen as failing because they weren't big initiatives that were developing overseas or multinational businesses. But actually, that's not what women were aiming to do. They wanted to augment the farm income while also being able to juggle childcare and on-farm work. And then people started doing some really interesting work on the gendered nature of space. So some of our Norwegian colleagues looked at how with farm tourism initiatives, tourists wanted to see men out logging. They wanted to see women in the house making traditional Norwegian food. There's a lot of work in Europe and in the States um, that shows that, again, the gendered nature of space, that often agricultural extension workers don't recognize women as farmers. They don't see them as the authentic farmers. And we know there's a lot of European research that also suggests women don't get access to the agriculture training they need. They're kind of bypassed, then training where it's provided becomes a male space and women don't feel comfortable to attend. This came up a lot in the, um, the Scottish research. Farming organisations. I went to the um, Scottish National Farmers Union when we were doing the Scottish research. Nicola Sturgeon was speaking at it. And there was about 350 people there, an all male executive of 26 men, and there was about five women. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later on about the Copa Cojeca, the EU overarching uh, farming body. And I calculated on the back of an envelope that they're about 90% men. But farming organisations are not seen as corporate boards, even though they influence policy. So they're not, they're not obliged to present a gender uh, breakdown. There's been a lot of work on whether women's farming organisations are enabling or actually the exact opposite. In some ways, it's it's a space for women to organise, to share knowledge and so on. But they're often seen as women's groups and they're on the fringes. They're not included in policy development. They don't have access to resources, with the exception of Spain. They're not nationally consulted on future policies. I've done some interesting work with a colleague of mine, Margaret Adizopa, who's done research in Nigeria. And we've compared women in agriculture and the agricultural space in the global north and south. The big difference is that while we've achieved much greater gender equality in terms of employment and uh, equal rights and so on in the north compared to more traditional societies in the south, it still looks very similar in terms of agriculture. But the one thing Margaret would say is that women's groups in Nigeria are certainly much more empowering because they, by have giving women that collective power, it can give them access to, um, to markets. Yeah, and then reflections. So I did this, Bettina and I were commissioned by the 
Parliament in 2010 to do a kind of overarching comparative analysis. I did women in agriculture uh, in the EU 27. Bettina did women in rural areas in the EU 27. There's not a lot of comparative analysis. A lot of, of work on women in agriculture tends to be case studies. You might have a comparison between case studies, but there's not a lot of that macro comparative analysis. Or if it is, it's at a very superficial uh, level. The quality of the stats are pretty poor. And, uh, you know, terms like women holder, women manager, women, they're used interchangeably. So it's, it's difficult. One of the things I found really interesting when I did that report is that inheritance is, you have a number of different laws across Europe. So in Ireland and Britain, you have common law. So I could leave everything to one of my sons and disinherit the other one if I wanted. Then you have the Napoleonic Code of Law, which is a different set of regulations about how you divide your assets amongst your children. And then you have the Elodial law, law in Norway, which in 1974 changed to make the eldest child the legal heir to the farm. And despite all these different legal frameworks, you pretty much end up with the same picture. And Norway's not much further ahead than anywhere else. So it, there's something interesting happening with inheritance. OK, and this is the basis of my reflection, the key reflection on all of that research, which is leading me on to some future directions. I think our research has had a very strong focus on women. We've really looked at women. We've looked at women's exclusion from farming organisations, from farming media. We've looked at women's lack of access to resources. We've looked a lot at how women are socialised. We've looked a lot at how women try to achieve change. And our focus has very much been on women. So I went back to an article which I love and reread. I haven't read it for quite a long time by Faree and Hall. And they, we know that sociology looks at persistent social patterns. So our persistent social pattern here is that women are on the fringes of agriculture they don't inherit land. Sociology looks at social stratification. So we're interested in how different groups have different abilities to access resources, to make life choices, to have autonomy, and to participate in decision making that affects them. And the main three types of social stratification we look at are gender and I realize gender is now a very complicated and complex uh, concept which I'm not getting into today. I'm talking about men and women as we traditionally imagine it in terms of stratification. So we talk about it has been gender, race and class. And when we look at these and how people have differential abilities to access resources and make choices, we've tended to use different levels of analysis. So when we look at women and gender stratification, we look at micro. When we look at race, we look at meso or that middle level. I'll explain that as I'm going along. And when we look at class, we tend to look at macro and structural factors. Now, these are the macro ar argument. Of course, we use all, but these are the ones that have, been te have tended to be dominant for each category. So I would think going forward, we actually need to use, use each more for gender stratification analysis and also look at how they interact. So we know societies are not static. You know, it's a dynamic process of how people interact with social structures. And this is how things are reproduced and transformed. And I think looking at that interaction will help us. So for example, when I did the Scottish research, I also interviewed women in family businesses who were not on farms. And I interviewed a number of um, women solicitors, lawyers, who had set up their own family businesses. And they talked about how, you know, they were, they were in a business, but felt that they would be 
discriminated as women when they wanted to take time off work after they had children and have flexible working times. So they set up their own business, brought in family members to have that flexibility. So you can see human agency interacting with the social structure that presents difficulties, but there is an imaginative way around it that allows them to do what they want to do and in the process create a more flexible working environment for everybody who's in that um, in their business. So gender stratification to call it that. It's very much a micro level. Uh, it's very much so focuses on socialization, but socialization of women. You know, men are socialized too. So how, how are both those levels working together? Socialization focuses on how women form identities, habits, preferences, but it doesn't tell us anything about processes of social expectation or structure. It's it's very much about women. And it it explains why women are in jobs, but then it doesn't explain why men don't necessarily accept women in those jobs. And I'm going to come on to that when I um, I look at the, the mesal level. Now, those of you who know Bettina and I well know we lost like three and a half months of our lives <laughs> preparing this Horizon Europe uh, bid for boosting women-led innovation in farming and rural areas. Now, you could say this is a macro level because it's coming from the EU and I will come back to that. And there's all kinds of things. I could talk about this alone for two hours. But one of the things that we were tasked to produce at the end of the research was that women would have enhanced capacities to innovate for change, improved skills, solutions to challenges faced by women, stronger networks, enhanced knowledge flows between and towards women innovators, rural areas and farming, having the ability to undertake successful innovation, <laughs> successful innovation support tools and so on, especially in relation to ecological things. My point here is it's all about women. This is all about us socializing women to have better networks, to have better skills, to it's about women and it's about women's deficiencies. And this is what we need to enhance. So, you know, where where what about women's access to land? What about the fact that men own land? What, what about all of that? What about that time and time again, it's been shown that the European Union's ACUS, Agriculture, Knowledge and Innovation um, supports, do not engage with women. There's a big difference there. What about farming organisations? What about the fact that common agricultural policy and rural development um, programmes are negotiated between Copa Kujaka an almost entirely male corporate board and DG Agri. And what about other EU policies? This is all about the micro level. It's about giving women skills, but not looking at that broader framework, which is providing real barriers and um, obstacles. Okay, I want to say something about the meso level, meso being a Greek word, which means middle. <coughs> This is most commonly used in race stratification or understanding racial prejudice. You know, when we look at socialization in terms of race, it's usually around um, having pride in your heritage and your identity and so on. But when we look at race stratification, we tend to look at how groups, uh, organizations, socialize each other at this meso level to have racial prejudice, to, to make that okay. Uh, how discrimination gets incorporated into the values of a group and legitimated and transmitted to new members through socialization processes and internalized. And okay, this is a, a racial analysis. We all live this in our everyday lives. I know two people who, broke, who voted for Brexit. One of them did so to hasten a united Ireland, which he might be right about. But you know, so we're all reinforcing each other's narratives and why Brexit was an awful thing and so on. And and we hear and repeat these these messages. Northern Ireland had uh, regional elections. 
it's very much the same. We reinforce our views and our narratives. This is happening in this in this race context. But what I'm saying is we all do this all of the time in different contexts. But what we don't look, do very much is while we look at how women are socialized at that micro level, we don't look at how those meso levels of prejudice and discrimination about women in agriculture are developed, internalized, accepted, and so on. So as part of the Scottish research, we did some focus groups uh, with men, and we did interviews too. I always like to interview men and women when I do research, but often again, research will often, the funder will ask you to only work with women. Again, showing that, if you like, focus on the micro level. And I've drawn out some of the things men talked about how they wouldn't vote for women to have positions of authority or to have positions in farming organizations as well. But I went back and reread all of these preparing for this talk, looking at patterns of socializing each other into it being OK. And it's actually it's hard to talk about it from print. I'd love to play some of the audio. Then I didn't know if I was compromising anonymity, so um, I didn't. So it's really interesting, and they do. They reinforce each other's views and thoughts, and it was particularly interesting because there was one guy in the group who has three daughters, and he had all sisters. And, you know, he talked about how one of his daughters, his middle daughter, would take on the farm. And the others, and I would go, really, will she, honestly? And, uh, you know, kept going like that. And he was saying yes, and she's kind of then gave her like she's the knowledge and she's keen and all this kind of stuff. And he would sometimes question some of the things that were being said and they'd all kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then come back around to the predominant narrative. So one of the things, you know, when I asked them about men inheriting more often the women and white, if they think that was and they very much talked about the burden of me. Well, first of all, they would say, oh, well, it's tacit. You know, there's just that expectation. But then they would bring it round to being the burden of being a man rather than it looking at the privilege of having the resources. You know, there's pressure on the poor guy to carry on the business. <laughs> and this this would go on. And then, you know, they would say, well, the girl might be less encouraged. What about the second son? And then the narrative will become, you know, sex doesn't have anything to do with it, really. And it's, it's it, 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 yeah, it's just really interesting. When I started to look at it differently, you can see this meso level kind of narrative that's that's developed. And I guess what I've, where I started with it initially, but then I took it somewhere else here, is that when they talk about the women in their lives, they're wives, daughters, sisters, mothers. It's a very different narrative at that micro level to what happens then when it gets a little bit more distant and abstract. Something different is going on there. Then they talk about the threat of a female heir. Like, so when would you invest in a girl? And it's harder to know with when to do that than with a son. And what if she marries the wrong guy? And you have this jumped up lab getting half your fire. And it was interesting because the, because I'm thinking it's exactly the same thing. If your son marries a woman and it doesn't work out, she's going to get half the farm. And the guy who had daughters said that, and they kind of agreed, but then went back to this. It's very hard, much harder to know when with a daughter you would hand it over. And then they, they talked about how much the situation has improved. They were saying, well, sure, look at the machinery ring apprenticeships. Look at, you know, it's that's improved so much with the number of women they're taking on. They said there's 12 apprenticeships and this year there's, is of two women. And, you know, this and then these kind of views of women that they've accepted the lead from behind and they were laughing and said, oh, they have their saved through their men and women don't want to go and waste their time this, with these silly idiots. And, you know, so so it's that's about justifying being invisible. Whereas it's justifying men being visible and taking control. So this meso level analysis, I think, kind of gives us an enhanced understanding of the kind of interactions of what's going on. This is the most pathetic image I know, but one of my 
<laughs> one of my colleagues was um, uh, hit with a lawsuit for using an image he didn't have uh, the rights to use. I have permission to use this from the Irish Farmers Journal. It's the most, pathetic, <laughs> it's the most pathetic looking protest, like honestly. But I mean, yeah, it's just give you a sense of what a, a, a gendered farm or what a farming process looks like in terms of, um, of men. Um, so, yeah, so then I got on to farming organisations and, you know, did they think women face particular uh, barriers coming into farming organisations? And there was a chat about, no, they were crying out for women, crying out for young people. Then they had this whole thing about how they wouldn't vote for women to have positions in farming organisations. But then it wasn't that people weren't bad. It was, it was just or that people were bad. It was just that their faces didn't fit. And then this, this really interesting kind of conversation came on that women wanted to get into the, that bear pit they could, but they'd have to get used to the rambunctious way people talk to each other. And then that moved into generally how women find it harder to deal with shouting and finally concluded you can't run a farm on a political politically correct basis when you're under stress so it's just like when you do start to look at it and i mean again we all do it i i know like i'm sure my conversations with brexit you know i'm, I'm reaffirming my views and notions but it's just really interesting to to start unpicking it I'm not getting into this too much, but um, Pierre Bourdieu uh, would say that men are also influenced by this kind of dominant um, narrative. And this is really interesting. This is a quote from a woman that I in interviewed for the English research, the DEFRA research. She was, uh, she came from a working class area in uh, Newcastle, the time that I'm living in now. She'd never set foot on the farm before she met her husband, Nigel, and um, he was like sixth generation, then really big, or he'd a really big herd of sheep. Uh, he wasn't making money, suffering with his mental health. She it, it was sort of interested in where the profit margin was and how much it was costing and and she kind of didn't like the way the sheep were being kind of force fed or wanted them to kind of Go, be pasture led and use less fertilizers and so on. Basically adopt the style of agriculture that everyone is pushing at the moment. And um, she slowly kind of persuaded him to do bits of it. And suddenly their, their profit margin was increasing. But it was really interesting. She talked about his cultural connection, how he, how he identified with the sheep community. And he went to shows, he showed the sheep. He, she talked about how there was this culture that if it's bigger herd, it's a better farm. And um, and then how your neighbours talk about you, if you're selling off livestock, you can't be doing that well. That it's very different to, to perform outside of the culture and norms. And he was really bound up in that. And he had to get there himself. So you can see the, the impact this also has on farmer behaviour. And that's going to be the biggest barrier, actually, to moving us forward to the kind of sustainable agriculture, regenerative farming we want to push. So, in general, macro level analysis, most commonly used in social class stratification. We look at things at the state global level. We haven't given a whole lot of thought to how the state maintains gender stratification, or when we have, we've kind of done it, I think, in, in a superficial way, and we certainly haven't looked at how they all interreact. And I guess the, the one thing that came out very clearly for me doing the work for the European Court of Auditors is that at the macro level, farming is seen as a sector and not an occupation. So it's about, head, you know, head of cattle, nitrates, you know, wheat, grain, what your subsidy is on your produce. It's there's very little talk given to the fact that actually people farm. Are these people men? Are these people women? What does it mean for diversity in the industry? What do we know about how they farm differently when they farm? You know, the, 
when the European Court of Auditors came to me, DJ Agri had said, you cannot gender mainstream, gender mainstream, I should have explained that. So gender mainstreaming means looking at policies to see if they have gendered assumptions. So it's not that the problem is gender mainstreaming nearly always applies to women. It's not about women, but it's about the, the gendered assumptions in policies. So for example, a number of decades ago, if you had given birth, you couldn't have sat on a, a jury because it was assumed you were hysterical and there's a gendered assumption in there. The, um, the marriage bar that women gave up work when they got married, there's a gendered assumption in that policy. So it was about examining policies to see the gendered assumptions. The uh, European Court of Auditors had contacted DG Agri because the Common Agricultural Policy or the European Agricultural Guarantee Fund is still the single biggest, most expensive policy. And they wanted to gender mainstream it. And the DG Agri said, you can't because it's not about people, it's it's about a sector, it's about farming, it's money in, money out. If you own the land, you're eligible for this payment. And that was when they came to me and said, is it possible to gender mainstream this? And oh yes, it is. <laughs> so these are some of the macro type um, analysis we've done. So this tells us the number of win holders, across Europe. So you can see here the Netherlands are at the very bottom at 5%. Ireland is there at 11%. This uh, is of interest. You can't see Norway on that, but Norway comes in about 15%. So the allodial law making the eldest child, the legal heir didn't have much uh, difference. Where we see huge numbers is in um, Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, Estonia, and that's because these holdings are tiny. They're subsistence holdings that are really important for household farms, food security, but they're not commercial. They're not eligible for uh, common agriculture payments. They're too small. They're below the threshold. So I always get really crossed when the EU says the number of women in agriculture is increasing in Europe. It's not. You expand it into countries. Europe expanded. These are new member states, and then they're using that aggregate to suggest the number of women in agriculture is increasing. That number for the Netherlands has not shifted in decades. And the same for Ireland. I was looking at that in the late 80s, 90s. That is not different. And you can see it more clearly here when you look at generational renewal. So the dark blue is the number of new entrants. Again, I mean, these stats are, I, I would wonder about them, but that's the number of new entrants under 25 in 2016, 25 to 34, nothing here. So you can see it's this narrative that the number of women in farming is increasing is really problematic. So, macro level analysis. Um, National and European state practices reinforce gender norms. Many of the EU documents I reviewed explicitly refer to his holding him. And you know what I find really, common agricultural policy is a really unequal um, policy. You know, 80% of the uh, income goes to 20% of producers. There's differences between what between sector, between regions, they've tried to correct for age, but they've never ever looked at gender. And um, there's no consideration of how CAP is negotiated with farming organisations, what that makeup is, how farming organisations are in effect a corporate board. And really, you know, DG employment, social affairs and inclusion monitors the labour market, monitors gender equality, tries to advocate and push that. Whereas DG Agri is about his sector. It, it's, it's about the, the industry of agriculture and it presents this view almost that people are not farming. 
So this is a quote from the European Court of Auditors final report. So they say it represents more than a third of EU funding. It provides income support to farmers through direct payments, single biggest program, and in bold, the direct payments regulation does not take gender equality into account and limits the member state's ability to do so. So there is research that shows the, the different income earned by women and men farmers in Europe, which is really quite substantial. Um, I did four case studies, one of which was Sweden. They gender budget, so they could see there was an unequal pattern to the way they were di distributing um, cap payments. And they could have what they said auto corrected, but because they don't design the policy, they administer it, they didn't have the power to do that. They will do now with the way the new cap is being um, regulated, but they didn't at that time. And DG Agri, the European Commission's response is that the payments are not specifically aimed at either men or women but rather at farmers. <laughs> so it's at farmers. Now, when you think of the science, technology, engineering and mathematics regulation, um, is it, it's a, re a regulation before a directive. They think it will become a directive now that the UK is out because they've held up gender equality for ages. But you know, you think of how that STEM regulation is looking at how do you encourage new entrants into, I'll just pick engineering. How do you change cultural norms in engineering employment? How do you make sure both boys and girls are encouraged to take the subjects needed to be engineers? How do they monitor career pro progression within engineering? how corporate boards are monitored, who's making decisions, who's on decision uh, making bodies. This absolute awareness, I would say, at a micro, meso, a macro level of how engineering is shaped to be a, a, a masculine occupation. So you've all of that going on. Farming is much more unequal than engineering like much, much more, it's the most unequal occupation. And the response is, it's not aimed at women, and, um, but rather at farmers. It's like saying, well, we're not talking about men and women, we're talking about engineers. <laughs> yes, I so I'm, I, I am finishing up now, but I just wanted, and my friend Anne was discussing this more, much more eloquently last night than I will do now, but I just want to have a quick look at micro, meso, macro interactions and the <coughs> example I'm using is childcare. So, and I've, I've seen research on this for architects as well, but the women and men that I interviewed have always seen childcare as women's responsibilities. They see it as a woman's responsibility. Now, my work has typically been in Ireland, Scotland, England, some in Australia, some in Canada, but in each case at the micro level, it's women's responsibility. And one of the women I interviewed in Scotland had this fantastic quote where she said, I think it's less of a glass ceiling problem, more of a sticky floor. <laughs> she said, it's all the stuff you have to do in the household that kind of ties you up and so on. And interestingly, at the meso level, so uh, in the UK, if you're on maternity leave, if you're on maternity leave for six months, you accrue six months worth of holidays. If you're on maternity leave for a year, you accrue whatever, five, six weeks. And I did not, I had not realised that it's actually, well, the state pays maternity leave, at like I think 80%. Your holidays are paid by your organisation, by your employer. So, I interviewed a farm manager, or I interviewed an estate owned owner in Scotland, 20,000 acres, and I was asking him if he had ever employed a farm manager, and he said no. And he said, it's amazing what people say when they've signed a consent form and the tape is running. And he said, and if I was interviewing a man and a woman, and they were equally good, and the woman was of childbearing age, 
he said, I think I'd probably employ the man. Now that's illegal. But I mean, if that's how he's thinking. But I also interviewed a woman who ran nurseries, um, children's nurseries. And she said she really struggled because she tended to employ women who were having children. And she said she said she could really see how discrimination can happen because it was such a cost to her organization. But this is state policy being pushed down to a meso level. You know, when you look at Sweden, employers do not bear the cost of accrued holidays. So we can see you know, the micro level expectation of men and women that this is women's responsibility. The meso level where organizations do start to kind of think, oh, this is going to cost me, I can't say it out loud. But, you know, and especially if I'm a small um, business and um, and then, yeah, and the men's focus group was great. They were saying, you know, the problem here is that at certain points, women start to produce children as if they have nothing to do with that at all. Um, and then just some of the macro levels. So in the UK, statutory leave is six months maternity, two weeks paternity. What I could find for the Netherlands was 16 weeks statutory and one week paternity. And then in Sweden, you have 490 parental days parental leave. So it's just a completely different macro message. And one of our Swedish colleagues recently published an article lamenting the fact that Swedish men only take 41 days of parental leave. That's if you're working a five day a week, that's eight weeks. That's half of what women in the Netherlands are getting this system. So the expectations are totally different. And I've also heard women, I've heard researchers in Sweden saying that childcare does not impact on women's careers up career opportunities to the same. So just to finish up, um, I think what makes it really difficult is land. Land is private property. Uh, and a group of us were having a row about this in Brussels after the weekend. You know, how do you come around that? How do you come around how land gets passed on and cultural norms tied up in that? I think the macro level is really important. I think getting out clear messages at that macro level is critical. We've seen it with STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. There's a good way to go, but there's a clear macro message there. I think political commitment is key. Uh, Sweden, you know, I think they're going to race ahead in agricultural equality now because they have, with this round of cap, they will have more control to set how it's regulated. Scotland is fantastic. I mean, the fact that Nicola Sturgeon as first minister rocked up with a gender equal cabinet and is really committed to this. And the indications are they, they committed 350K per annum to increasing gender equality in the last program for government. And I've heard that that is likely to increase in the next program for government. And they're hitting it at every level. They um, they're doing unconscious uh, gender bias training with machinery rings and farmers unions. They're doing training programs for women. They're developing an equality charter, something like Athena Swan. And if farming organisations don't sign up, they're talking of cutting subsidies or being less eligible for payments and so on. And then Ursula von der Leyen, you know, who has seven children and is still very successful, is really committed to kind of shared parental leave. And some feminists are saying to the detriment of other things, but I think that's going to be really important. And I think we can see, especially when we look at the STEM, the importance of looking at micro, meso and macro levels of interaction. And yeah, we need to understand farming as an occupation and not a sector. So the final image, uh, Bettina and I were we had everybody trying, neither of us can draw, look at it images. <laughs> and we needed a sexy image for our uh, application. And we found um, a, a Moldovian student actually in Newcastle. And we told her the, our, the title of our uh, proposal was grass, grass Ceiling. And she came up with this image, which I think is, uh, yeah, fantastic. So 
let's hope we can break the grass grass single. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. It's always fascinating to hear how in Europe we tend to focus on the micro level and say that ownership of land doesn't matter, but if we look into the south, then it matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we want to know who owns the land, then it should make a difference. Now we're thinking, we're listening to you, that I think certainly for the Netherlands, the link with family farms also makes is important. So it doesn't matter if men, they are in, in it together. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. But it's up to you for questions and comments. Who wants to have a question? The first is always difficult, but she, she, wants a question. she doesn't yeah. like. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I think this is really interesting. I was wondering about the role of the state, because you mentioned the state in relation to childcare. Um, but when you were talking about DG Agri and the payments coming directly from the CAP to, does the state have no role there in terms of gender proofing that the money goes to the farmer rather than management? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and that's a really interesting question. So, and again, it was only when I was doing that work for the auditors, I started to think about it. So at a national level, when the cap payment comes down and you had like the pillar one, pillar two, pillar one being agriculture, pillar two, the rural development loosely, even though a lot of that rural development money went back to uh, farmers. But, you know, you had national monitoring committees, you'd rural development monitoring committees for pillar two. And that, there was some looking at, you know, how many women were on local action groups, how many rural development initiatives, did women participate and so on. But the pillar one payment had no monitoring committee. You know, that was money in and money out. It was, uh, the multi-annual finance framework, it was agreed <coughs> on acreage owned, you know, it, it, so it, and at national levels, and any that I had was involved in, dispensing the pillar one payment was seen as really easy because it was in and out on those, on, on like farming, on the sector, on what was being subsidised. But there was no consideration of, of gender in that, no. So it kind of filtered from the, from the EU to the um, member states. Yeah, and this is where, so Sweden is the only EU country where their gender equality was more advanced before they joined the EU. Whereas for all the other member states, they're their gender equality has improved with the EU. Mm. And, um, you know, when I asked, I, so case studies I did were Sweden, Spain, Ireland and Romania. And when I asked the Irish people about it, they said, if you want us to monitor it, the EU need to put it in the requirements and then we'll do it. Like they didn't ask me, whereas the Swedes had already spotted this discrepancy themselves and were frustrated they weren't able to correct it. But no, that money was money in, money out on a sector. So, yeah. Yes, please. Sorry. So, yeah. was some of the issue for you, you raised the issue about Sweden and the women were actually earning less than the men? And they did look at the breakdown of the income. Is that what you said? No. So, what they found was that they found gender bias in the way that they were distributing. It was actually money under the second pillar under the rural development program. So you could apply for a grant for farm modernization. Okay. And men tended to apply for larger grants. They tended to apply for bigger pieces of machinery. Women tended to apply for smaller amounts of money, smaller pieces of kit. And they find that in general, if you were applying for a larger amount of money, there was this kind of unconscious assumption that it was better application and you knew what they were doing. So they were able to track this because they gender budget. So they see who, who are they paying their money to. I mean, that's a really effective tool that the European Commission pushes but doesn't do itself, but the Swedes do. So they were able to see 
some of the, the differences in the where they were making payments and they could have corrected for it, but they administer a policy. Uh, it, this is right across the way when you look at women entrepreneurs, they tend to start smaller, build up uh, uh, an enterprise and it's it's I would expect it's it, it's generally the way women entrepreneurs uh, go into uh, enterprises. The, the UK did a big, it's called the Rose Report, where um, uh, NatWest the bank found that the, there was unconscious bias in the way they reacted to women entrepreneurs because women will ask for smaller amounts of funding, start smaller businesses and so on. And have smaller businesses. And have smaller businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if it's possible to try this to also to the regenerative approach you were talking about in the beginning, just for those kind of backgrounds. In my understanding, smaller machines and those like kind of huge machines. So I was wondering if that's part of it, and it just ties into my question about how you see the transformative potential of the crisis we are facing now, like the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, and how that ties into breaking the grass ceiling and if you see opportunities for that. That's a really good question, and it is absolutely linked to coming at, at things uh, differently and wanting smaller pieces of equipment for it. Yeah, because, and it goes back to that, um, Yeah, this one here. So they massively reduced their herd and have stopped using fertilizers, have grass uh, based production. Their profit has increased. They've gone back to native breeds. It's much, much better. But, you know, this woman um, said it took it, it took her husband a long time to get there because there is this assumption that bigger is better. And that's, as you say, that's the enterprise model in general that's also pushed to farming when in farming that does not hold true it's it's about maximizing your your profit i mean it's interesting i actually think the english government defra <clears throat> are now really starting to take the role of women in the family farm more seriously because it's instrumental they see that they may be able to get them to where they need to get to because as we know, diverse industries are better and ironically being freed of the cultural norms to farm the way it's always been farmed gives them the ability to do that. You would like to think that the massively increased cost of fertilizers will help speed up the tr transition we want to make. But I really do think the big barrier is going to be changing mindsets. It's about the cultural norms, about the ways of doing i think it's going to be hard to do there'll be some really progressive people moving things forward but how quickly it will happen you have to wait and see so that if you say the mindset of the most mindset yeah coming at things differently okay yeah I, I would like to share a bit and also give some comments um I think you 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 really took a nice uh, perspective by showing these different perspectives how they do communicate with the different levels or not, and uh, I think uh, I also see a kind of way out because uh, Francis race is always connected to history. How did we get there? How was it built? How was it changed? And that's the same for gender. And what I miss so much in, in a lot of sociological research is that it's never taken into oh, never, but hardly taken into account all the historical, um, also meso and micro uh, research on how we can see the agriculture sector profession as gendered. Mm -hmm. And there, I think there are lots of clues and uh, if you bind it together, I'm, I'm starting to, to get my final book on that, but then you see a lot of things that makes it, uh, ex yeah, that you can understand and why it takes so long. Uh, for instance, when I started my thesis, I took not agriculture policy because you don't see gender in agriculture policy, you never see, but I took the policy on how men and women should be socialized through education or through extension. 
And there you see all the debates, what should women be men in agriculture in the future? Mm -hmm. And it's so clear there, also for race, how segregated it is, how it's spread all over the world. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we still live for that because fi family ideology is still so very pro predominant. And uh, there's another comment I would like to make this data collection. Um, women in Netherlands are complaining all the time. They don't really measure us and they're right because they take only the oldest yeah. person uh, or the one who works uh, the most hours. So they, they somehow they can't process that there can be two managers on the farm. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's really what you say a sector and profession because they uh, they keep on uh, this this look on the sector um, with not. Uh, I always said from the beginning we have to read people agriculture and not the only one, of course. But I think it's a very important message uh, to, to get beyond that. And also, uh, I'm now working in a sprint uh, project on pesticides, and they. Uh, uh, they can't get the data for their information because there are no big data collections on farming that uh, disaggregate among women and men farming. But also a lot of research just doesn't uh, disaggregate uh, between young and older farmers. We keep on asking the majority of farmers are the old farmers, but we should also know uh, is there something happening with the new farmers and how can we build on that? Uh, so that's a, that's an important thing, and also the global south north. Uh, we can learn a lot from the south when you talk about meso level uh, uh, ways of addressing uh, gender norms, uh, how they influence, uh, and that's what we tried to do in the conference last year. But <laughs> if they're not really uh, online, they influence each yeah. other. But uh, I think. We, we can learn a lot there. I can, um, yeah, yeah. You are great. Thank you. Those are fantastic comments. I'll just I'll try and give a quick response to each of them. Your point about history is absolutely right. You know, I mean, of course, for a long part of history, women could own property, it wasn't theirs. Owning land was tied up with relationships with kings or lords or so on. So I agree completely. There is a history and a history to the whole. Um, question of race. The one holder, I mean, in a sense, I think that, and again, I completely agree with you, and I think that is a problem that the EU has compounded. You know, because actually, if you look at Canada, there were really effective campaigns back in the 1990s by the Canadian Farm Women's Networks. You can have two, three, four holders, you know, and it's it's much more flexible. But because the agricultural, because the EU insists that you have one agricultural holder to whom the subsidy is paid, it's it's really cemented that problem. So I think that is a, a real issue. In terms of young farmers and what's happening with them, when I was doing that work for the, co the um, auditors, I contacted CJA, who are the Young Farmers Organization, and I asked them, <clears throat> if they could give me a breakdown, a gender breakdown of young farmers in Europe. And they directed me to the Women's Committee of Cobra Kojeka. So, uh, and that was really disheartening that the Young Farmers Organization are not monitoring gender either and see it as a women's issue. So they flipped me back to um, the Women's Committee. But yeah, thank you. Very good. Thanks. Not to do also in our own institutions, of course. Mm. We're also part of the macro level. Amazing. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Right. I know a lot of these are family farms, and I'm just wondering is there a process where there should be a partnership on a family farm where the woman and the man are equal in a partnership? Like yeah. if you think like into another type of business. Whereas, like now it seems that when the family farm is uh, applying for something, it seems to be only through the men. Yeah. And, and, and like maybe there's something to be done where it, there should be a partnership there. Yeah, absolutely. And it comes back to that point of like the EU requiring one holder. There's very limited, I mean, the data on partnerships. Is there are, France and the Netherlands has partnerships, but it would not be, it's, it's not, it doesn't match the Eurostat data. 
which is also the reason why the Ministry of Agriculture responded to the question about how come that we have only 5% farm holders today, it's a statistical error, which is too simple and not true. But it's true that we have partnerships and then we arrive at almost the same 24%, because a lot of farms have a male and a female holder together, not always on equal terms, certainly not always translating into uh, common um, prop, uh, own, com common ownership of land. So it's it's a it's a it has and it not always means that people have or women have as much to say. But the, the structure exists and exists also in France. But it's not yeah it's not part of the statistics. And still, I don't know how they then probably there is still one with one percent more who gets the subsidy. I don't know exactly, but there is one point of contact with the with the cup. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. but it does exist. But it's so the, the formal and the and the daily practice are also two different things. But I always say in the end, it does make a difference because when you divorce, you have half. Yeah. No, it does make a difference. Yeah. It's not just paper because some people say it's just in paper. It's not just it paper. Be on paper it should be on paper, but it, no. But I mean, it, it shouldn't be on paper in the sense they should be equal partners if they're running yeah. the farm together. Yeah. As you say, they're yeah, yeah, but they have to divorce anyway. Yeah. But it's yeah, there are all kind of constructions, of course, of, of with double professions and double incomes. And how are you calculating mm -hmm. that? So the, the the reality is much more complex mm -hmm. than the statistics. But, uh, just a question. question on there. Lines. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, and I think for the one at the this one first. Um, yeah. A question from Maura Farrell. Yeah. Well, first of all, says so Sally, thanks a lot for a great presentation. And then she asks, can I get your opinion on women only knowledge transfer groups or women only farm walks set up as women are not attending mainstream knowledge transfer groups? And Laura says, I have reservations about these, but interested to see what you think. Yeah. Um, thanks, Laura. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week in Newcastle. <laughs> um, it's a really interesting question and one that we've kicked back and forth over the years. You know, as I said, women only groups often tend to be seen as a women's group uh, rather than an agricultural group. At the same time, it's often the only way women get access to that knowledge transfer. So when we <clears throat> when the task force, the Scottish task force was sitting, uh, we were having a roaring debate about whether we should provide women only training. And the, the task force was completely divided on it. Then um, the Scottish Farm Advisory Service had some funds and then the task force worked with them to provide uh, some women only training, which was immediately oversubscribed. And I think that's the answer. I, I think there is there is a role for uh, women only knowledge transfer groups, but somehow we have to work out how to bring them into the mainstream. It, you know, because otherwise we're we're having something that's always going to run on the fringe and we're not tackling the core problem. So it's it's how we do that, but not then think everything's resolved, but somehow make that feed into addressing the core question. It's a really difficult one. Isn't it also interlinked with what the training is about? If we talk about regenerative farming or a transition to another type of farming, it just, that is, there is also not a lot of training on that yeah. in the classic. Mm. The, the classic farm organizations are not or hardly dealing with that. So there is a kind of double. Um, potential double inclusion, but also yeah, yeah. double exclusion. Absolutely. And it comes back even to the narrative, you know, uh, of that EU call on boosting women innovation, where it's all about women. It's mm -hmm. and it's not about the wider picture or the structural obstacles or so on. And it's how you try to address those. No, but it was also about women in, in ecological farming. Exactly. Whereas there is, yeah. there is also a problem there. There is a shift in, in cultural yeah. there. But it's it's also I think a lot of fear about that change. Mm -hmm. So can I get a the blocking change on, on two levels, on the gender level, but also on the kind of farming. Are there more questions on that? Good. <laughs> <laughs>
Access to land, I guess what I saw, and I'm trying to write something actually about this at the moment. What was important it wasn't so much about the size of farm, but how people come into it. So if you look at law, you have a lot more women in law now because the way you get into law is change, go to universities, not through like being invited and practices. And then I always get this wrong, so keep me straight on this. So you have um segregation and segmentation. I always get them mixed up. But basically, you see more women coming into law. And uh, but you see that segregation that you still have fewer women becoming partners in in the law business. So they're they're at this level. And that's what I've seen about women coming into agriculture that where, because the Scottish government particularly wanted me to try and find women coming into farming. And where I did find them, they were renting land. Now they tended to have a partner, they both tended to have um, well paid jobs, and they were renting this farm and doing it. They were really productive, and there is research that shows that part time farmers, and of course they're both well educated, are really productive. But you suddenly realise there's this segregation. You're not being handed this big asset. You actually have to have an additional source of income to be able to rent land, which isn't cheap. So I saw that kind of division more than be between the um, consolidation of firms. In terms of heteronormative assumptions around agriculture, absolutely. And, um, you know, Carolyn Sack, some of her colleagues in Penn State have done really interesting work on that. Hannah Budge, who's my PhD researcher, and that's her at the front with her two sisters kind of behind her and a family friend. Her two sisters are running a big farm in Shetland. She and I did a bit of work um, during COVID looking at the implications of COVID on, on gender roles and mental, women's mental well-being on farms. And, you know, we have some very preliminary findings there where we found that um, all women households tended to be more equal in terms of how, what's happening around renegoci renegotiation of roles and impact on mental health. But yeah, it's, it's something that has developed in terms of research, and I think there will be a lot more on it. But Penn State, I think, are really doing some good work in that space. There was some work years ago, also been in Illinois, about yeah. men sharing the management of the farm. We saw exactly the same, that we don't fall back on these natural uh, inside or outside or caring for the small animals and car for the big. And you also see you know, so some research where women farmer would marry, men would marry into a farm and people would take more care to give him some significant roles because he couldn't just help out. So there are these kind of funny, strange uh, natural scenes. And I was wondering for the amount of land in the Netherlands, at least there's a clear difference how the farm is legally organized. So the biggest farms are not family business, but are big things. I don't know how that is said in English, but it's a different legal organization and more often shared among brothers. And 
and not 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 including the wives as an identity conflict, but it's it's a different organizational form and that has also to do with the risk you run and the depth you run and how you can fiscally best organize things. But I think that is also mixing up the the yeah it makes it more difficult to find out how it land is Any more questions? Comments? Yes, please. I think um, I was wondering about the intersectionality, and uh, I was curious as to the way that that barrier in picking or the new analysis, whether that's focusing on the farm owners or operators or managers, but also include farm laborers, workers, signal workers, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that I didn't think about the grass ceiling for immigrant farmers or yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a, a, a really interesting question, and I think the the lived reality of agricultural migrant workers is also very complex because they can be seasonal. It's about how long they're able to to stay for, and again, that will very much come back to micro, meso, macro policies. I've been involved in some work looking at migrant workers' rights for looking at it from an English per perspective where they're trying to get workers in for the smallest amount of time and get them out, whereas the Scottish government are very much approaching it from this is a really vulnerable group of workers, how can we protect their human rights? So you can see that macro level will really um, factor down, you know, what that means for farm ownership, you know, migrant workers, agricultural workers are very unlikely to be owners in the place in where they're selling their labour, but what that means for their own agricultural holdings in their, their, their own country is, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Maybe European Union has somehow some hopes of using the farms and guaranteeing the continuity of that agricultural production in the European Union and talking also about women, about youth, about migrants, about refugees, but actually I think the reality is it's very, very hard, it's very hard to find, right? Also because it's very different to find land, it's a lot of money, but they are in, uh, in some of our students, so how do we have new ways of getting into land, or starting to do production, by land sharing, by land renting, and they're so they sharing the of agriculture. Do you know how many women and yeah, yeah, like there, are, yeah. there are a lot of women in farm labor, particularly in horse culture? Right. And I think more men in uh, arable. EU is tracking that as well. I think it's different, right? That's an for the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, but I would assume that that's a similar across the nations. It depends on the kind of work they are doing mm -hmm. and in what culture there is always this idea of need funding, right? And, yeah. where, and whereas in others, they might need more strings, but, but um, I, I have as well the figure, but I know that there are more than. And I don't know exactly. Any more questions or comments or comparisons? Uh, we want to have one last good question for the. We might have time for one more question. Also, one from. I'm going to say we might have time for just one more question. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, Claudia. Yeah, I find this uh, study, this comparison you did with uh, between different legal systems uh, with sort of a similar outcome and independent of the big differences between the legal systems uh, about the inheritance. But I was wondering whether you also looked historically because uh, despite this, this, this outcome, I was still by the impression that, that things have been changed. So there were historical patterns in, in different countries where you had, I don't know what the English term is, First one or last so, one? Yeah. So, so when, it, uh, one of them inherited the. the oh, private genitor, is it? Yeah. 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 Private genitor. Uh, in most cases, when it was male, but it's still only one person, so the rest had to go up, I believe. And we also find that a lot in the 
different places in Latin America. Probably come from Spain, I don't know. But I think question that that kind of crucial facts are no longer allowed. So there's a sort of formalization. So that means that the mechanisms through which uh, uh, discrimination or exclusion takes place are different nowadays than in the past. So if you think look at those changes in legal practices. But I didn't look at those so much, although it's a really it's an interesting it's an interesting question. Certainly private gender has changed. It's not always the, the first one. And it is true that historically, yeah, how legal systems develop, well, it matters and they do change over time. I mean, Ireland has the same as Britain because we were a colony, so we've inherited their way of, of doing that. I think for me, I mean, I think you're right. I think cultural norms can sometimes are, are stronger maybe than, than the legal framework. For me, what was really interesting was just how, even though these legal frameworks have different rules about how it can be distributed, it is, as you say, there's something else going on. They've, they've circumvented this. Yeah. One very, very, very last question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Grant and Carl and Hutchins, yeah. I'm wondering how, in the context of the how shots may be productive or personal shots can how personal shots 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 yeah by the predictable event that happened maybe in the how that in the household how that can increase the discriminality in the between men and women because uh, we know that taking example from the country in the south we know that women they lack more resources, yeah. and so when they are affected by shots, the discrimination will be bigger. Yeah. How is it in this context? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that's. I mean, it's a really interesting question, and Margaret Alston um, in Australia has done a lot of work looking at you know the very pronounced gender different implications of drought, of uh, flooding and so on. At, at a lesser level, we very much saw, saw it when we started looking at the implications of COVID mm -hmm. on women in agriculture. And there was a real reversal in kind of going back almost decades in, in gender equality and the roles that people were assumed to take. And at an EU level, I mean, there's a lot of work that shows when you have austerity and financial crisis, the commitment to gender equality just you know, pretty much evaporates and certainly takes a, a back seat. So I think, at, at, you know, at a global level, at, we see it in different ways. So I think that is true. Okay, thank you all very much. Then we close this session and thank you, Sally.